So good, e good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Bradley Cantrell. Uh, I am the um, chair, of chair and professor in landscape architecture and coordinating the Summer Design Institute. Welcome to the uh, Summer Design Institute lecture series. Um, I would like to begin with a recognition that the University of Virginia is located on the land of the Monacan people. We give our honor and respect. We also acknowledge the enslaved laborers that built the grounds and architecture and contribute to the spaces we occupy today. So I'm pleased to introduce tonight's lecturer, Katie McDonald. Katie McDonald is co-founder of After Architecture and is an assistant professor of architecture here at the UVA School of Architecture. Katie holds a master uh, in IMARC from, uh, from the Harvard GSD, um, where she received the Paul and M. Heffernan travel grant she also holds a Bachelor of Architecture from Cornell University. Katie has been recognized as Next Progressive by Archit Architect Magazine, Emerging Designer in Virginia by Design Awards, and Curbed Young Gun by Curbed National. Her creative work has been honored with an AIA New England Design Honor Award in Special Projects, a Core 77 Do Design Award in Built Environment, two Architizer A Plus Awards in Architecture and Collaboration, and a nomination for the Mies van der Rohe um, European Union Prize for Contemporary Architecture. Katie has taught at Virginia Tech and the University of Tennessee, receiving um, the ACSA Housing Design Education Award for her teaching. Professional training includes work um, at the office, offices of Mall, Morphosis Architects, and Lorcan O'Harely Architects. Um, her talk tonight is titled After Specification. Please welcome tonight's guest, Katie McDonald. Thanks so much for the introduction. Um, I'm excited to, to be here tonight and um, to share my work um, and also to be kind of joining the UVA community. Um, so I'll share my screen now. Um, and yeah, I just wanna um, start out by saying how, how excited I am to be joining UVA and to share my work tonight. Um, and that you know much of the work that I'll show tonight um, uh, kind of is reflective of kind of collaborative projects. And so I'm very indebted to those collaborators. Um, and um, yeah, so I'm going to get started by talking a little bit about um, kind of standardized materials and the way that thinking about materials shapes my research and practice. And so there'll be kind of five sections to this talk. Um, and I'm going to start by, by thinking about standardized materials and their kind of legacy on, on architecture. Um, so I'll ask you to consider the work of, of Charles and Ray Eames, um, who, who kind of um, wood um, sculptural forms are, are kind of embedded in this history of material and technological innovation. Um, so the very kind of um, effort uh, of producing any of these things not only required a kind of design ethos, but also an understanding of material and technology and this kind of commitment to, to innovating and, and inventing. And so on the left, you see a kind of sculpture by the duo. And then on the right, you see the Kazam machine, which was developed for some of these kind of molded plywood um, pieces. And, and so I think when you consider the work of the Eames, you come across this kind of interesting question, which is why uh, the kind of furniture and even kind of art objects of the Eames resemble what you see on the left, um, the LCW. And, are kind of very embedded in this uh, tradition of material invention and, and inventing the machine itself um, versus their kind of architectural legacy, which is maybe better captured by the image on the right, um, case study house number eight, which is also known as the Eames house, which is maybe by contrast um, assembled from a series of kind of industrial um, materials that have been specified and haven't been developed for this particular project. Um, and so in a way, kind of each of these constructions is the result of post-war um, you know, production uh, ethos. But on the, the kind of piece on the left uh, embodies a, an, an effort towards maybe invention. And the effort on the right is more emblematic of a kind of specification practice. And so this is a, a kind of practice that I see um, developing um, through the 20th century through modernism. Um, it's connected to things like architectural graphic standards, which is introduced in 1932. Um, it's connected to the kind of 
heroic modernist buildings um, in which materials are oftentimes just as important as kind of the forms themselves, um, which we see as a kind of legacy that continues even beyond modernism into the work of, of Frank Gehry and other kind of deconstructivist um, architects. And so this kind of relationship that starts to take shape between standard materials, industrial materials, and modernism um, becomes kind of tightly woven in the exhibition by Lily Reich and Mies van der Rohe, The Dwelling of Our Time, in which a series of modern homes were exhibited in a large exhibition hall um, and then surrounded by a mezzanine of industrial materials used to kind of construct the homes. Um, and so in this moment, the kind of uh, relationship between standardized materials and modern design becomes kind of um, explicit. Um, and I think today with the kind of Countryside the Future exhibition um, by Koolhaas, Bantal, and um, AMO at, at the Guggenheim, we see a kind of renewed interest in this architecture exhibition looking at industrialization on, on a large scale this time focused more on, on a kind of rural vernacular um, of, of production in terms of food and other products, but again, interested in kind of ideas of scale. Um, and, and so these kind of, kind of obsessions with, with the standard part um, and the way that it shapes the world um, continue to be kind of central to the dialogue of architecture. We see Aaron Bessler's kind of uh, elliptical um, stud installations, Anna Niemark's sit uh, dolmens, um, Lida Aguirre's kit of parts architectures, and then Michelle Chang's um, kind of drywall uh, assemblages, um, all taking these kind of ideas of the standard material part and, and seeing how they can push them, how they can play them, how they can kind of make the material the message. And so I'm interested in how uh, kind of changing ethics um, change the way that we might use materials um, and specifically how kind of changing ethics might require us to rethink the standardization of materials. Um, and so I situate this work against a kind of backdrop that deals with a rise of technology in not only in architecture, but in our daily lives, which I think is kind of encapsulated by Nicholas Negroponte's being digital. Um, and also a kind of climate reality, which becomes more and more dire, uh, which is kind of encapsulated by the uninhabitable earth, um, Life After Warming, uh, the book by David Wallace-Wells. And so in kind of considering uh, the rise of technology, the, the kind of um, development of technology, as well as the kind of in, in importance of the climate imperative, um, I think we can look back at that kind of standardized material maybe um, the humble two by four and say, is this performing in intelligently? And, and what is the role of this kind of piece of, of industrial product today? Um, when compared perhaps with maybe the more intelligent, um, structurally complex natural form of the tree. Um, and so I've been interested in, in how we kind of identify ordering systems in natural materials um, in the work of land artists like Andy Goldsworthy um, and also how kind of relationships with nature have been constructed in architecture um, through kind of biomorphic, biomimetic, um, and kind of morphological tendencies. Um, and so I'm interested in constructing a kind of new relationship between these systems in which authorship is shared between designer, technology, and biology. And for the kind of purposes of this talk, I'll, I'll call that kind of framework bioagency. And so bioagency distinguishes itself from biomimicry and morphology um, by using technology to instrumentalize the embodied intelligence of rapidly renewable biomaterials. Um, whereas the kind of biomimicry is more concerned with the design of material structures and systems that are modeled on biological entities and processes. And then the morph morphological um, is more interested in the kind of study of forms of living organisms. Um, and so I've kind of mapped some practices that I think are working in these, these various realms. And I think on one extreme, the morphological is more interested in visualization and form, whereas perhaps the kind of uh, 
biological agency, which I referred to, is more interested in materials and processes. And so much of what we'll look at today is, is dealing in that realm. Um, and specifically in, in terms of thinking about how materials can start to be authors. Again, kind of adding to that dialogue between the authorship of, of materials, of, of designer, of biology and technology. Um, and so as a kind of example, um, I'll ask you to look at kind of digital fabrication practices. Um, so digital fabrication, um, in the kind of wake of the digital turn uh, was interested in kind of complex form generated by subtraction through standard materials. Um, that kind of irregular form that results on the top right um, is coming from a very standard material on the top left. And so some of the work that I see happening now and that I'm uh, engaging with is looking at how instead we can take materials which are not regular, um, which are comp complex in form and in effect also have kind of complex structural intelligence um, as well as other intelligences um, and how technology such as kind of 3D scanning and other modes uh, of kind of data capture allow us to harness that intelligence in turn producing kind of opportunistic form. Um, and so that kind of example of, of traditional digital fabrication can be seen in these two projects. Um, the one on the left in which Kind of CNC milling allows the kind of replication of a, of a standard architecture, the one on the right in which a very complex form is generated, but through the reduction of that standard plywood sheet. Um, versus maybe some of the work that we see today coming out of places like AA Hook Park, where um, technology is being used to understand complex forms. In the case of this project, the, the fork of a tree. Um, and then to use that kind of series of tree forks intelligently within a design structure where both the kind of designer and that material input of the tree fork have a kind of input on the final form. So I, I'm interested in how we extend this, how we push the material to have more of an impact on the form. Um, and so I've developed this research uh, related to bamboo and how we might apply this kind of logic to bamboo um, bamboo historically has been limited because of its irregular form, um, because of its size and, and its, uh, you know, difficulty in becoming a, a kind of standard piece. Um, nonetheless, it's rapidly renewable. It has kind of incredible structural qualities. And so the, the kind of promise of technology to unlock some of that, that intelligence um, and that strength is very exciting. And so in this project, um, working with a, a team of, of other scholars, including Kyle Schumann and Jonas Hopman, we developed a way to scan a, a, a bamboo pole, essentially by taking a series of um, you know, 2D images and then mapping them together um, using a kind of custom workflow in Grasshopper. And the kind of result of this, this ability to capture the data about each bamboo pole um, is that we can reconcile that kind of precise irregular part with uh, a design um, design form. And so our design intention can be altered based on the input of the form. And so on the top, you see a kind of idealized triangulated form and how that might start to be adopted to material supplies with various kind of characteristics. Using a bunch of shorter bamboo poles um, we're going to get a different effect than if we use kind of longer um, poles. And so the, the geometry of the pole starts to become an actor within the design process. And so a project like this also develop, uh, involves the development of, of kind of joints and nodes which can deal with a flexible system. Um, and so this is a kind of project that's still in development and, and will be exhibited in the coming year. Um, the next project I'll show is again kind of pushing this logic of that, that mediation between technology, material, and um, designer. And so here the, the kind of modes of working are, are looked at a, as a way to be kind of democratic. Um, and so instead of using maybe a complex uh, scanning apparatus or kind of high cost technology, um, the kind of basic building block of the system is a smartphone scanning app, which is available for a few dollars, um, which can be used to, to document material inputs. 
So in the case of this project, this kind of um, user-friendly cheap uh, iPhone app is being used to scan a series of branches. Um, and then the branches are being analyzed um, computationally for a kind of variety of qualities. Um, and, and by kind of performing this series of analysis, we're able to extract certain data from the branch that can become useful to us in the design process. So here, uh, the kind of student project that developed this work is looking at branch radius um, as well as branch curvature to inform a final design. A system of parts um, is, is developed. So a kind of dialogue um, is developed through a system diagram. And in effect, the material inputs are kind of reconciled against a design intention to produce a design, um, which is uh, in which the kind of branch inventory is optimized. So the thicker branches are located near the base of the assembly where they'll be stronger. And then the curved uh, branches are located at various parts of the assembly where the geometry is more curved versus more straight. Um, so here you see a kind of final installation uh, from that workflow um, where, again, you see those thick branches at the bottom and the thin branches on top. Um, so this work has also been developed uh, with other materials um, as a kind of testing. Um, and so in, in this kind of sequence of images, you see a variety of kind of digital inventories being made of, of often natural material streams and then various kind of aggregation methods being tested. Um, so the kind of idea that scanning technology might allow us to create kind of digital doppelganger of a real material, um, that we might develop the kind of intelligence to use that complex material computationally, and then that that might translate back into the physical world. Um, and so these are kind of a series of quick tests, which uh, experiment with various aggregating methods, packing, tensile spring simulation, um, et cetera. And so here you see a kind of uh, series of images which describe one of those um, attempts in more detail from that kind of uh, rendered inventory all the way to the kind of final aggregation which mimics the, the digital um, assembly. And so the this work, um, I think is aided by a kind of interest in procedural authorship. And I think we can learn about procedural authorship from a long history of art practice. Um, this includes fluxus art in which authorship was often shared between many parties um, and kind of sequences of activities were orchestrated um, and, and performed by many. Um, we see kind of procedural authorship in the work of Alan Wexler um, in this piece He's taking a curved tree, um, operating on it through kind of collage um, in order to straighten it. So he kind of creates a series of subtractions in order to straighten it. And then in back in the physical world, he inserts these wedges um, to translate that original curved log into a straight log. And so there's this kind of idea of operating on, on the complex form um, both through drawing and through physical manipulation, which I think is useful to these kind of modes of working that I'm describing. Um, I think there's also a very interesting kind of procedural work happening uh, by Donna Kupkova, who in this project is creating a series of nets, um, which essentially are acted upon by dough. So the dough kind of drips through it in various ways. Um, so in some ways, the kind of behavior of the final sculptural object can be programmed or um, controlled. But in many ways, the dough itself has kind of a life of its own, um, where it co-authors the kind of final object. Um, this is also something that's kind of informed a, a drawing practice exercise in my teaching. Um, here, students are attaching a kind of series of pens to branches and allowing kind of wind movement to produce a drawing. So there's again this idea of, of what the designer is setting up versus what the designer is allowing kind of other system to perform. This work uh, and kind of approach is also something that I see happening um, in the Mediated Matter group led by Neri Oxman um, or by the practice The Living led by David Benjamin. Um, 
in which non-human actors become the kind of construction team. So in the installation on the right, uh, which is constructed of mycelium bricks, the process of then growing mycelium um, becomes very important in, in achieving the effect of the final assembly. And then the image on the left, Mary Oxman's silk pavilion, um, sets up a kind of scaffolding for silkworms um, to produce their, their, to spin their thread on, um, but then allows them to, to really start to author some of the kind of porosity, density, um, and visual effect of, of the creation. Um, and so again, these kinds of themes are, are something that I've been exploring through teaching um, in, in a class taught with Kyle Schumann, my partner in after architecture. Um, and so we looked at the work of artist Diana Schreyer, who um, deals with kind of roots, um, with these kind of root bound structures. And we borrowed from her this kind of process of, of uh, growing barley seed, um, but instead tried doing it hydroponically as to not have to deal with soil. Um, and in this case, we paired the kind of growth of the barley seed with a 3D printed mold. So the designer would enact on the system through the creation of the mold, and then the barley would have some kind of life of its own in terms of how it would grow in the mold. Um, so in this kind of exercise, a, a variety of almost fabrics were produced um, of various thickness and kind of folding capabilities. So it started to be kind of like a, a grown origami. Um, here you see a, a kind of living hinge grown, grown through roots. Uh, and then um, starting to kind of transform this into a 3D system where the roots actually become kind of framework for a 3D object. Here you see a bowl. Um, and so this kind of idea of the, the author um, collaborating with uh, the designer collaborating with the, the, another species as co-author is seen again in this caterpillar catenary project, um, which maybe like the silk pavilion is interested in, in how um, kind of caterpillars or silkworms produce silk. Um, but in this case, the, the tent caterpillar is known for producing a kind of um, tent made of silk uh, along a, a kind of branch um, fork. So here you see a, a, a normal fork uh, with a tent caterpillar nest on it um, as a kind of example. And in this project, what we're trying to do is kind of control the behavior of the, the tent caterpillar. And so in order to scaffold this project, we looked at its solowitz variations uh, of incomplete open cubes. Um, which produces a kind of matrix of um, corners um, in which the space of a cube is suggested, um, though often not fully wrought. And we produced a series of simulations um, using a kind of shrink wrap script in Grasshopper to, to kind of suggest how the tent caterpillars might build on these scaffolding. So we could produce a simulation and then kind of test that through allowing the tent caterpillar to inhabit and build uh, on the structure. And um, what we found was that the, the tent caterpillar was actually quite difficult to control. The simulations varied wildly from the actual behavior of the tent caterpillar, um, but that some of the kind of qualities of the tent caterpillar could become really fruitful, particularly the layering of the tent um, in terms of making a, a kind of final uh, object. Um, and so here you see the kind of multiple layers of, of the tent on the scaffold, which then create a kind of filtered lighting effect, um, maybe not on like a Nelson lamp um, or other kind of stretched cloth uh, lamp assembly. We're also interested in how you scaffold the behavior of cocooning and egg laying. Um, and so these kind of series of objects um, were produced in order to house the, the cocoons, um, creating a series of, of holes which might transform into other uses, the use of, for a clock or a, a light fixture, um, but would be kind of sized appropriately to hold a cocoon um, for the kind of caterpillar's life cycle. Um, and so in this way, there's a kind of dialogue going on between a design intention to produce perhaps like a household object and the, the moths um, 
you know, life cycle and need to kind of recycle into becoming a caterpillar again, lay its eggs, et cetera. Um, so the last section that I'll show um, is related to this kind of idea of material cultures. Um, and in and in some ways uh, deals with some of the kind of issues raised about standardized materials, but in other ways um, deals maybe more readily with the kind of conventions of construction. So the first project that I'll show is a um, project that I completed in graduate school. Um, it was selected by competition and then realized with um, the faculty who are the head principals of Office Architecti in Slovenia. Um, and so the project was looking at this network of mountaineering shelters um, that dot the, the Alps in Slovenia. Um, and these are kind of very important shelters because they provide just bare accommodations, basically just a roof above your head, no electricity or plumbing or anything like that, um, but a, a kind of, uh, you know, place that one can stop along these beautiful mountains as they hike. And so it's really the infrastructure for this kind of national pastime um, and a, a regional pastime really because the kind of country of Slovenia is quite young. So here pictured, you see one of the first um, mountaineering shelters in the country, which was installed in 1895 and doesn't even have room to lie down. It's kind of standing room only. Um, and the kind of prompt for this project was to develop a mountaineering shelter in this network. Um, so the, the idea of, of kind of installing um, a project in this realm requires immediately the kind of considerations of construction, specifically how you're going to get the project to the site um, as you can't pull up with a truck or a crane. And so in the case of this design, the module became really important um, as something that could be easily deployed to site um, by helicopter um, and then conjoined with other modules to form uh, a kind of larger whole. And so early in the process, the helicopter pilots um, who were part of the Slovenian army and also the, had access to the heaviest weight helicopter in Slovenia became kind of key players at the design table. Um, and the kind of orchestration of the modules was very much informed by their kind of intelligence and how they might fly these things. And then on the image on the right, you see the kind of three modules of the shelter, um, a stack of, uh, of glass and a stack of kind of foundation materials, which constituted the five trips of the helicopter to site. Um, here you see the kind of first module arriving to site. Again, um, it's being transported by helicopter uh, a series, like the kind of construction team has just kind of completed hiking up um, the mountains to arrive and, and to secure this uh, module. And so the entire kind of act of production is this kind of intense um, off-grid off experience. And here the kind of material palette is shown to mimic the surrounding stone. The glass reinforced concrete panels um, are Kind of installed as a rain screen and match the the gray of the stone and then the image on the right shows the way that the the door accommodates kind of heavy snows by um splitting into the materiality of the interior is by contrast to kind of warm wood um which maybe transports the domestic to the top of this mountain um its stepped profile in section allows for various surfaces to accommodate multiple functions. Um, so sometimes floors become seats um, or beds become tables. Um, every surface kind of uh, doubles in function. And then the screen provides kind of structural reinforcement and, and subtle privacy between bunks. And here's a kind of final image of that project on site. Um, the next project is a, again kind of in this tradition of the of a kind of small shelter. In this case, it's approaching the the vernacular of the the cabin, um, which we see represented um, maybe across American pop culture, um, all the way from kind of literature, um, you know, David Thoreau's Walden to the kind of vacation kitsch of the maple syrup can. 
And so in this project, the, the elements of the cabin um, are identified and then hybridized into a kind of seamless wrapper. The porch, the stack of woods, the fireplace, um, all become one system. Uh, a rain screen which holds wood um, embeds a porch and is kind of flanked around a central fireplace. Um, and this screen which holds wood allows for the project to have a kind of dynamic facade which is constantly changing as wood is consumed um, or replenished. Um, and the kind of construction is designed to be very sensitive to the kind of local resources um, and you know deal with some of the kind of constraints of, of building um, in the forest. So here's a kind of a final rendering of the project on site, which was originally developed for a cabin competition in 2014, um, but is currently being realized in Vermont. Um, so here's some construction pictures from last summer and the project's quite a bit further along um, this year. Um, the next project that I'll show is a memorial um, located in Washington, DC. It's a memorial to a contraband camp, um, which is a typology um, that emerged during the Civil War, um, which was essentially a, a kind of refugee camp for those escaping slavery, um, but was also uh, you know, not a great institution. Um, those who inhabited the space continued to have limited rights. They were literally considered uh, captured enemy property or contraband. Um, and so this, this site, which is um, right near the Capitol, um, has a very important leg legacy in the area. Um, for one, spawning the kind of um, rich African-American community around it, um, but uh, also a, as being a part of this network of camps, which are largely kind of uh, unmarked today. And so um, the current site where the contraband camp it was located um, is an elementary school, um, which occupies kind of three sides um, of a city block um, with one corner kind of eroded for a church and an apartment building. Um, and so the project uh, sought to illuminate this history, and it also sought to maybe critique a kind of tradition of Civil War monuments, um, which I think we're all quite familiar with in Charlottesville and in Virginia in general, um, and maybe see a renewed kind of conversation today. Um, so in particular, we're interested in how the memorial would, A, kind of um, identify and mark this history and B, function in a different way than the traditional memorial as object kind of monument, um, instead relocating the memorial to the kind of edge of the urban fabric um, where it would become part of everyone's daily life whether they entered the site or not. Um, and so kind of by contrast, the nearby Logan Circle has an equestrian clad um, Civil War uh, sculpture um, and the Camp Barker Memorial on the right um, is located on three sides of the site um, with a series of, of different geometries of portals, um, which allow all visitors to the site and kind of public park to pass through. Um, the specific kind of material of the project responds to a context of kind of white marble structures. Um, the type of structures that, that we see, the renewed interest of the president um, today. Um, and in contrast to that kind of history uh, of classical architecture um, and, and what it symbolizes, the project takes on a different material palette. Um, a charred wood um, recalls kind of strength through hardship. Um, it's a material which is resilient, UV resistant, rot resistant, bug resistant. Um, despite the process that it's gone through. And so it becomes a kind of metaphor for the great pain suffered by those um, who took shelter at the camp. And then the brass liner inside um, becomes a way to kind of address the future, to allow people to see themselves in relationship to the history, to provide warmth um, within this kind of uh, undulating uh, wrapper. The 
portals also include a relief sculpture by Vinnie Bagwell, um, who's an artist known for her narrative depictions of African American history. And so she created these beautiful black and bronze relief sculptures, um, and a different one is on each portal. Um, and they convey some of the kind of history of the site and uh, related history of the time in order to kind of, kind of connect the contraband camp to a larger African American history. Um, so here you see the kind of final portals on site. Um, the scale and geometries are designed to engage um, the school children who spend so much time on the site and also to wel welcome people to the public park. Um, while acknowledging the important history. Um, here you see some, some children kind of taking residence inside the structure, um, and then a, a kind of final image of one of those reliefs integrated into um, one of the single portals. Um, so I have just two more projects to wrap this up. Um, the first that I'll show is was installed at the Oslo Triennale last October. Um, the Triennale's theme was enough, the architecture of degrowth. Um, and it was really speculating on what architecture would be outside of systems of capitalism or systems of infinite growth, which is maybe a kind of question that sees renewed interest in a time when economic growth is very difficult um, due to the kind of context of the pandemic. Um, but the installation responded to a kind of history of biennales and triennales in which um, substantial kind of cost, effort, um, and time is allocated into these temporary pavilions, which are uh, installed in kind of materially intense, intensive ways on site um, and then destroyed and, and sent to landfills in the end. Um, and this project uh, kind of advocates for a different way to transport and exhibit architecture. Um, it constructs a, a series of pseudo masonry arches out of a red fabric. Um, these kind of brick modules are thermoset into the fabric, um, giving the fabric a kind of structure when it is unfolded, um, but also allowing for the fabric to squeeze very tightly into a carry-on suitcase um, and be unfolded without wrinkling. Um, and so the, the kind of final incarnation of the project on site shows this uh, vernacular of the brick and the red, um, which we associate with kind of thickness and permanence, transformed into something light, airy, and transportable, um, and deployable in kind of various configurations and various sites. Um, so the last project I'll share today, I think, um, maybe circles us back to some of the kind of initial arguments. Um, it, it addresses a context in Tennessee um, where invasive plant species are, are hard to escape. Um, uh, perhaps some of you will recognize this species because um, we also see it in Virginia. Um, but this is kind of a classic uh, Tennessee landscape um, overgrown by kudzu. And so um, Kyle uh, and I, um, who completed the Tennessee Architecture Fellowship together, um, were interested in how kudzu could become a kind of architectural material. And so um, one of the kind of student projects that developed in the fall option studio that we taught together was one that was interested in using pneumatic forming um, to make biomaterial panels um, of complex geometry. And some of the kind of ideas behind using pneumatics were that you could create complex geometries um, and many variations of mold without, uh, you know, kind of creating a bunch of waste, uh, creating a bunch of foam molds that would only be used once. You know, what if the system could instead just be controlled computationally and could reform um, many, many times? And so building off of this kind of logic, um, the, the kind of panels that could be produced could be complex in form. Um, they could be kind of complex in material. The geometries could be accommodated to, to whatever the material input was based on its structural capacities. Um, and so we were interested in how this kind of idea of maybe a kind of furniture made of bio uh, materials, in this case, bamboo, scales to the size of, of a building. Um, and so this is a, a project that we're 
currently um, developing and building and will be installed at the Knoxville Museum of Art in October. Um, it, it was meant to be installed uh, earlier, but of course COVID-19 um, threw some of those plans to the wind. Um, but we're interested in, in how we engage that kind of tradition of the standardized materials. Um, so you see the form on the left, which is kind of quite flat, which is um, reminiscent of the kind of panelized construction that we're familiar with. And, and then we contrast that with the image on the right, which is a topological structural optimization of that form. So basically it's taking that form and saying, where does material need to be in order to structure this thing? Um, what if we start to erode the panels and instead have a kind of complex uh, form, which varies in thickness and material is only used where it has to be used. And so, um, Going off of that kind of premise, we've been developing a kind of biomaterial composite panels, which again read kind of flat and panelized on the exterior, but then in the interior reveal a kind of more complex form, which is shaped by the structural needs of the assembly. Um, and so even the kind of windows and apertures which make a space habitable um, end up becoming the kind of remnants of the structural uh, requirements rather than maybe kind of willfully deployed. Um, and so here you see a, a simulation of that interior geometry, um, where again, the exterior uh, skin is flat and panelized, but the interior wrapper becomes much more sculpted based on the structural needs of the assembly. Um, in order to kind of represent and study the material effects of this project, we developed a series of kind of um, root uh, representations. And so here you see an elevation um, that was grown out, out of barley roots. Um, and then a series of kind of test panels of what a kind of texture of this biocomposite panel might be like. Um, and so here are the last couple images. And then um, you'll be able to see this project in Knoxville in October um, or, or online uh, then. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Katie. It was great. It's great to see all the work and um, great to see your kind of take um, take on um, particularly these issues around um, um, biomaterials. Um, we can open up for some questions. Do people have questions for um, for Katie? I have a couple, but <laughs> I'll, I'll let others chime in. Any questions? Maybe maybe I can start then, and then we. We typically um, get the ball rolling. I, the one, the one question, and I think one, one thing you lay out really nicely is the difference between the work you're doing and kind of um, ideas around um, um, biomimicry, particularly. Um, and in that, there's there's a um, there's a a relationship that you're talking about setting up between the designer and the and the material because because of the agency that you your 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 stating the material has. I guess what I'm what I'm wondering a little bit about is like, in that there's um, I, I see a, a really kind of great care in um, to the deployment of the in, that initial agency and how it how it actually takes form, and I'm wondering about this kind of what what you might be thinking about in terms of like a longer term relationship between the designer the material that might go beyond that initial deployment and if that's some like if the, that thought process is going into the work moving forward or or how it might be going into it at this at this point. I, I think that that's a really great question, um, right? Like that that may be that these systems aren't only part of the construction, but they're part of the life cycle, right? Um, that the, that they continue to have a life uh, beyond you know the opening date of the project, and much the perspective of a landscape architect, um, <laughs> uh, whose work of course gets better as the plants grow in. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think that's a great question, uh, and something that the work could definitely learn from. Um, I think much of the work has been interested in the kind of process of realization, um, but there, there is a kind of interest in, you know, um, how living systems might, might do more, right, in terms of like air filtration or in terms of providing habitats to other species. Um, so I think those are really interesting concerns. Um, but yes, I, I would like to learn from 
from the kind of the beauty of the landscape project, which which gets better over time. Um. <laughs> I think I think um, there's also a, I mean one of the other in interesting things you bring up in this for me at least there's also um, just another cultural relationship between people and architecture that I think is you know it it, it begins to it begins to change right and so I think that that aspect of kind of caretaking. Um, and, and, and kind of things like this is, it's just another interesting kind of way to think about how people occupy the architecture, but also care for it, perceive it, and, and how it is situated within kind of um, like the larger kind of urban fabric. So I think, yeah, I think, you, I think you're, there's a lot of interesting issues you start to bring up with this. Um, we can, Quentin um, has his hand up. Quentin, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, so with looking at materials, are you looking at craftsmanship or trades people to handle certain materials in the built environment or how are you approaching that? Yeah, I mean, so I think uh, that's a huge concern, right? Um, maybe one of the kind of uh, building related industries that's seen the least innovation is um, the actual kind of construction side of things. Um, the kind of implementation of BIM is, is definitely there, um, uh, but the, the actual practices are, are maybe slow to change. Um, and that relates to kind of trades which are very set in their ways or, or don't wanna change. Um, and so that's definitely a kind of concern. Um, but I don't know, I think there, there's multiple opportunities in that realm. I think part of what, what I'm, I'm hoping for is that we begin to become more nimble about the way that we use materials, um, that we rely on specification less. Um, and so in, in some ways that means some of these things have to be uh, constructed by, by specialists or experts or not the traditional trades that we're used to. Um, and, in, and sometimes that means even the designer or the architecture firms kind of taking on those roles. And I think we see that in maybe like the early work of uh, LTL and, uh, and other practices. Um, but ultimately to have these kind of ideas um, implemented, you do need buy-in from the construction industry, right? So the, the goal isn't to say, let's get rid of, you know, the trades, but how do we rethink them? How do we innovate? Um, you know, maybe the Eames could create a Kazam machine uh, in the 40s to make furniture, but they couldn't do that at the scale of the building. I think now we have the digital intelligence to be uh, more innovative, but at, at a large scale. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, so uh, Robin has a question and then Chris um, Osterlin has a question um, in, the, in the chat, I'll let him ask. So Robin. Hi, welcome. Thanks. Uh, so uh, this is in a way a, a, a possible follow up to what uh, Brad was asking we're talking about, and it's, it's not really a question, but it's uh, what I find really fascinating about the work you're doing is that um, by engaging um, other critters to help you and by dealing with um, things that are growing, you're fundamentally changing the relationship of uh, the way we think about um, our life as separate from all of those and the larger world that we live our life within. And so, I'm, I'm fascinated to think about how far you might be, you know, pushing this as a, a, a you know, a philosophical, cultural, constructional design, uh, um, um, just ethos, really. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's exactly, um, I think that's exactly what I'm trying to get at. So I think that's really well put. Um, you know, the idea that that somehow what we do could be better aligned with other systems that we might not think of ourselves as being so dominant or so hierarchically important, but that we might do things that uh, are to the benefit of both or in the interest of, of multiple systems. Um, so yeah, I think that's a really important, uh, important kind of aspect of it. And of course, it, it's in a way very radical, right? Because it sets it changes our relationship uh, with everything. Um, but I, it seems like a kind of imperative in order to deal with um, the climate imperative, but also all the kind of 
social and cultural um, issues that are related um, to, to those kind of embedded hierarchies. Chris, do you, do you want to about that introduced into the curriculum? Mm. Sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, Brett, sorry, I had some background, so I was going to put in the chat, but, um, okay, thanks so much for your talk. It was, um, yeah, great and very intriguing. I love the range, um, in the projects. And one, um, question that I've kind of come across through SDI is, um, how to really hone in on a concept where there's so much kind of innate meaning in a project. And I'm curious about just your process, um, as you approach the Garrison Memorial and how, you kind of unpacked all of the history and arrived at a design concept. What was the conversation like? Um, how did you go through iterations and finally arrive at the, the design concept that you chose? Sure, yeah, I think that, that's a great question. Um, you know, uh, what's interesting about a project, uh, you know, a project that serves a client, right, versus a research project is there's, a, um, as soon as you get to the table, there's kind of already things you have to deal with. And so, um, part of the kind of challenge with that project was kind of a, a initially receiving the brief and realizing that um, maybe what the kind of client wanted, which was, you know, an arts organization organizing art for an elementary school, um, wasn't something heavy, right, um, but was something that would be kind of welcoming for school children. Um, and so it was uh, kind of a a, a, maybe a difficult move or a big move to say, well, actually, I think it's really important that we look at the history of the site, right? And that we, you know, uh, correct the wrong of this kind of erasure, right? There's kind of, there's no trace of, of that history on the site. Um, but for us, in terms of doing the project, that was what was going to make it important and meaningful and worth doing, um, not maybe just putting up something that would be nice for kids. So um, in that process, we dealt with the history. We had to learn about the history of the site. We had to try to gather information on the history of the site, which was limited. Um, we had to start to think about who, who, who's being served, um, especially because the region or the area um, is, has been a historically really strong, culturally rich African-American community. Um, and it's already facing kind of problems of gentrification and the erasure of that community um, as kind of rents in DC rise. Um, so all these kind of factors uh, at play um, kind of came into the project, but ultimately um, we kind of made a decision to pursue this history of, of the memorial of, of remembering the camp um, and then to try to speak to that in a way that was uh, that could be abstract, but also quite potent. And I think that the material language for us has always maybe been that vehicle. How do you use the material to kind of uh, elicit effect, uh, you know, create an emotional response um, and then allow the kind of viewer to dig deeper. Lucia? Um, Katie, it's great to see your work again, um, uh, even at this distance. Um, the question is following up on Chris's uh, question about um, how you approach each project. Your projects are mostly quite different and unique into themselves. And, you know, more typically when a architect has a project, maybe it's a formal project and things look pretty similar and develop from there. And I'm interested in just hearing a little bit about um, what is common in your process of studying these projects and arriving at um, kind of an outcome. Sure, yeah. No, I think that's a great question um, because certainly uh, while, um, you know, my co-founder Kyle and I are, are both interested in form, um, form isn't the primary driver of our practice. Um, we don't have like a set of formal moves that we kind of need to deploy, right? We're more interested in what we can kind of pull out of, of any given project. Um, so I think the, the ethos that is maybe consistent across the project is one that's interested in um, kind of cultural uh, and material qualities um, 
it, you know, whether it's a research project or it's a, a client serving project with a site um, and whatnot, uh, really the material seems to become a kind of driving narrative. Um, and oftentimes we're trying to use that material in an inventive way, right? So even if we have to use something um, cheaper or, you know, uh, kind of well-established, we're trying to kind of alter it a bit. Um, so I would say, yeah, some of the binding interests across the work are really material in nature, um, but they're also maybe narrative in nature. Um, and we love form, but we're not attached to a certain set of them. Do we have other other questions for Katie? Uh, I think I think I have a question here. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what it is, but uh, when you were talking about um, this idea of 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 working with standardless materials in intelligent ways, I mean, I was thinking a lot about landscape architecture because that's what I study, and how um, you know every site is kind of this. Uh, in some ways standardless ground you know that, that you shape um and how you how you kind of come to know that material like really affects and how you abstract that material like really affects kind of how you design with it um and i like i was really interested in the bamboo project but i think part of me was just thinking like like is it like one more step that you don't need like to to see it very computationally like with the the precision of the computer and i i wonder if i i think it was a really cool project and like almost a cool like um proof of concept that you could apply to a lot of different materials um but i wonder if you think about that in your practice much about like when sort of a computational method or like sensing method is necessary or when it's sort of like one more thing that sort of like I don't know, adds another step? Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's a great uh, question. Um, you know, it, it, in, in a way it's like about editing, right? Like how do you edit things out? When is it, when are you using something just to use it? Um, in the case of the kind of bamboo work, um, there's of course a very rich history of working with bamboo, um, but there's also like very real limitations to bamboo. Um, and those that include it, it's kind of lack of standards, um, but also maybe it's kind of cultural reception. Um, and so I think another kind of component to the, the bamboo project, which maybe doesn't come up in this talk or um, is, is separate, is the idea of, well, how can we transform the reading of bamboo to see if we can make a kind of, um, you know, an audience receptive to it. How can we disassociate it with Tiki Huts and, and Gilligan's Island, right? Which no one should have to do in a way because, um, you know, those are kind of unfortunate cultural realities. Um, but I, I think the technology in, initially came in as a way to kind of transform that and then really became a way to say, oh, actually, we can use this in, in much more intelligent ways. Um, so, I would say not every project maybe demands technology, but sometimes you can have a kind of good reason for it. Thank you. Maybe I, I'd love to follow up just with one, I think it, one question just kind of dovetails on a, on a couple of them, which I think is, uh, and thank, thank you, Katie, it's great to see you again. But just your, your, your work brings up a lot of really interesting questions in the field and one of them I think is about scalability and you know it's really interesting to look at the look at the history of standardization through these multiple lenses and I also think like a parallel lens to that that I was thinking about is like you know the ASTM and you know the engineers you know and the standardization of materials for liability and structural safety and things like that. And I, and I sort of think that, I mean, you could kind of go down a rabbit hole and thinking about it that way, but I guess the question would be, you know, in terms of the work and in terms of what is achievable for the architect in this situation, is it, it do, you, do you see the role as, as like providing a proof of concept of 
the kind of formal and the, the kind of quality of spaces that should that can and should be thought about in terms of using materials like bamboo or these, these other materials? Or, or is it about a proof of concept that it can somehow at one day maybe begin to replace some of these other types of standardized materials and, and flows and processes and things like that? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's a good question. So um, I would say that the the kind of goals of the projects maybe have have maybe there's like kind of two central goals of the research projects. And one is maybe to kind of prove out a, a system, um, right, um, to develop a workflow and, and to prove it out. And oftentimes you can kind of prove out maybe the important parts with a kind of small scale prototype. It doesn't demand maybe a whole pavilion or something, right? But I think the second kind of part of the, the, the kind of goal is to prove it out um, for an audience and maybe not even a disciplinary audience, right? But to, to convince the public that this is a way that we can work, we can build, that it's not just ideas, right? That it's, that it's scalable, um, that it's reality. And so, for me, the kind of idea of a pavilion or a small structure becomes important as a proof of concept that says, you know, we can do things this way. Um, you know, look, it's been done. Um, and it's a, it's a kind of, um, I think it's a kind of important uh, scale transition in, in order to make the work uh, extend beyond uh, a kind of one-off research project, right? The, the kind of goal of the work is, ultimately to, to shape the way we build things and, and to have a life beyond. Um, so so in, I think the proof of concept is important for that. I don't know if that's what you're asking. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's just interesting because for instance, you know, one, you could argue that maybe like one use of the computation is maybe to say, well, all you structural engineers now, I mean, you do everything computationally. So yeah, we can calculate the thickness of walls that we need to construct a, a bamboo or, or other material structure and and prove that it's that it's safe to occupy and all these things and that we can in fact build from it. And so just kind of thinking about the tools that we have available to us as a way of, you know, making these things. Cause I because I'm just thinking about it because I would think like that would be like maybe one area where you'd start to get the like first bit of pushback, you know what I mean? In addition to the cultural one, I think. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a super important point. Um, Mario Carpo in the second digital turn writes about like basically the process of engineering being transformed from one that's kind of linear using formulas to one that's like iterative computation. Um, where you can try many, many, many iterations until you find ones that work, right? And there might not just be one that works, um, but it's like much more of a kind of iterative process, almost rooted in an artisan like knowledge of like how things go together by instinct because you've done it so many times. Um, and I really love that passage of the book because yeah, it basically says, well, we have to flip engineering on its head, right? We don't. We don't have to to perform based on this historic model anymore, and that would have huge implications if if we could get buy-in on that, right? For how we deal with codes, um, for how we deal with standards, um, and so it's a huge kind of piece of the puzzle. Tom, did you have a question? Yeah, um, thanks, Katie, for the lecture. It was awesome. I think, like Carl John was saying, I've been sitting here trying to process it all <laughs> and figure out exactly what I want to ask. Um, but I'm thinking about how you're talking about the, how we build better aligning the systems and the work that you did for the Oslo Biennial and how there's sort of an impermanent quality to that architecture. And wondering if you could speak a bit more about how you see that sort of impermanent mobile architecture maybe playing out in a real world scenario. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's a, that's an interesting question. I think um, maybe some of the kind of uh, 
promising qualities or interesting qualities of a mobile or temporary architecture is its um, uh, its kind of scalability or its um, industrial production almost that you could could sell it like a product right like the way uh, other industries you know product design or, or fashion right are able to kind of uh, make higher margins on their you know their wares um, based on that that kind of production cycle um, so in a way there's a kind of argument there for for scale and growth, right? Um, but I think on the opposite end of the spectrum, there's also a kind of argument for the fact that, um, you know, populations are much more uh, transient now, right? That people move much more often, that if we invest in an architecture, that we might be something that we want to take with us, right? Um, that, you know, maybe there's ways of thinking about, about time that architecture needs to last, right? like that the way we've been constructing is with a bunch of materials that aren't even gonna degrade in, in landfills, right? Um, so I think there's a number of kind of questions about, about time and, temper, and temporality that are wrapped up with the way that we consume and our relationship to the climate, um, you know, climate change, uh, essentially that our expectations of permanence are, are damaging in many ways. Um, and so that that perhaps there's some lesson there for for an, an impermanent architecture as being uh, a solution to both kind of cultural changes and uh, you know the greater needs of 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 the planet. Thank you, um, Katie. Thank you so much for the lecture. Thanks for taking the time to answer everyone's questions as well. We, we all appreciate it very much. It's great to it's great to have you here uh, for the SDI lecture series, and we're excited to have you here this fall. So, thank you. Uh, th th this was great. Thanks so much for having me, and thanks for all your great questions. So, uh, looking forward to joining you all in Charlottesville. Great. All right. Thanks again. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye.